Thank you. Thank you. Look. All right. Listen, um, I don't cry, I sweat. But I want to give a massive shout out. My wife and most of our kids are in isolation right now, and they're watching online. So can we, <clears throat> can we just thank Kat and the girls as well for... I love you guys. Man, it's been a big few years, but we're here, and we're not going anywhere. So I just think, you know, also because I'm about to lose it. Can we just worship a little bit longer? Come on. Yes. We're going to sing, I have never walked alone. So long, I've never been a bed. You are my inheritance, and you are my strength and shield, and I have confidence. You go before me, you're my deliverer. I know I'll never walk alone. I've never been the bed. You are my. Jesus, that this is your church and that you are building your church, Lord God. And if you're building your church, the gates of hell, they will not be able to stand, Lord God. We thank you for every story. We thank you for every breakthrough, Lord God. I would dare to say this is not us. This is you, Lord God. This is what you do. This is who you are. You are good and you are in control, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, today for what you have done, Lord God. And we are in anticipation for what you will do, Lord God. We thank you that the best is yet to come, Lord God. And today, we commit this moment to you. I pray, Lord Jesus, speak through me like I know you've spoken to me, Lord God. And I pray that when we leave this place, may we leave this place more in love with you, not impressed by church, not impressed by events, not impressed by production, but Lord, to be pressed on our hearts, the love of Jesus the presence of God in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And if you believe it, can you shout amen? Amen. 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 Come on, can we thank Jesus today? Amen. So good. So good. And can we also thank the creative team? You guys are awesome. Thank you. You can grab a seat. You can grab a seat. And also a big hello to everyone that's watching online, uh, whether you're watching streaming us online or whether you're in one of our locations. Malmo, we love you guys. Olba, Aarhus, we love you. And you know, every story over the years, I, I, 
I was just saying before I walked up, I'm like, I, I, I can normally hold my stuff together. But on days like today, I get, I get super emotional. Because <laughs> you look around, and it's not just faces, it's stories. And you, you know the stories, and you know most of the stories. And if you don't know the stories, you know the stories of the people who brought you, and that's a story. And it's just, it's just, man, the faithfulness of God. But not only that, the faithfulness of people. The faithfulness of incredible staff and volunteers and team and people that have just laid down their lives. People that will never be in the spotlight. People that will never be on the platform. People that will never be in front of the camera. But people that are just behind the scenes, just building day in, day out, week in, week out, setting the table so others might sit down and eat. So come on, can we give a massive thank you to every team, every volunteer, every staff. We love you guys. And what is cool about church, if this is your very first Sunday, you are as much part of this family as any of the guys who put their hands up that said, well, I've been here all nine years. That is what's so amazing about church, is that the moment you step in, you are part of it. You are suddenly engrafted into this family. And throughout January, we've been doing this whole series called First Things First. How, how do I give the areas that matter the most my absolute best? And we're just in this, this month of January just going, hey, why don't we set a direction, a trajectory that we are believing is going to last throughout 2022 and who knows, maybe even for the rest of our lives. And the whole idea is this saying that we've often said around church and that is choose when you're strong who you want to be when you're weak. Choose when you're strong who you want to be when you choose when you have money in the account. What kind of person you're going to be when there's no money in the account. Choose when your relationships are strong who you're going to be when you're in the middle of a battle. Choose when you are in your right mind what kind of person, what kind of habits, what kind of person you want to be when all hell is breaking out around you. I just think too many of us, we allow the seasons and the circumstances to dictate our convictions and habits and the person that we are. As if our convictions, they're dependent on feelings. As if our convictions are dependent on what's going on around us. I thank God that we're part of a church that is not just allowing the seasons and the circumstances to dictate our mission and our purpose and why we do what we do. No, who we are as a church, it is who we are. Come good times, come challenging times. It is who we are. We are who we are. We have made a choice. This is who we are. We are. The other day I was reading a, 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 I came to the part of my daily Bible reading of, of Joseph. And Joseph, as you know, he was the great grandson of Abraham. So Father Abraham was actually for him, great grandfather Abraham had many sons, great grandfather Abraham, many sons had great grandfather Abraham, and I am one, and you are one. But anyway, Joseph, he was the great grandson of Abraham. And and the Bible says through crazy circumstances that he was sold into slavery. And at this, this place that he got sold into slavery, he did what he did. He was who he was. And he served faithfully with what was in his hand of opportunity. And he trusted God with what was in his heart. A few years later, he is wrongfully thrown in prison. What was his response? He is who he is. He served faithfully with what was in his hand. He trusted God with what was in his heart. Two years later, he gets promoted and he becomes second in charge of Egypt, serves right under Pharaoh as his right-hand guy. What was his response? To serve faithfully with what is in his hand and trust God with what was in his heart. The circumstances didn't change his calling. The, 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 the temporary moment didn't affect who he was. His calling was to serve faithfully with what was in his hand and trust God with what was in his heart. Well, I believe, church, that we've all been given things of value. Things of value that you and I, we have been called to serve faithfully. And this month, we've been talking about, we've been talking about faith. We've been talking about finances. We're going to be talking about family. We're going to be talking about health. These are areas in our lives that we have been entrusted by God to serve faithfully to steward well, to do well with. And basically, the questions we've been asking is, what are some things that I want to stop doing in 2022? What are some things that in 2021, it just caused regret and shame and wasted energy and 
you know, what are some things I want to stop doing in 2022? And what are some things I want to start doing in 2022? Why, why put it off any longer? What are some things I want to start doing? And what kind of person do I want to be doing this in 2022? And Proverbs 3, 5 has really encapsulated this whole idea. And it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And he's going to make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, shun evil, and this will bring health to your body. Come on, somebody. And nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of all your crops. And then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Your vats will brim over with new wine. Today, I want to speak on the whole area of family. Is that okay? And you cannot talk about family without thinking about one guy, and that's Dominic. So uh, Dominic Toretta, if you don't know, I just want you, you know, just have a look at the screen uh, because this, this just, this spoke to me. Here you go. Dad, can you help me with my homework, please? Do you know what two times seven is? Family. No, Dad, it's not family. It's family. No, Dad, it's not family. That's not the real answer. But what's real? His family. Dad, you're not helping. Have you got any friends that I can ask instead? I don't have friends. I got family. Dad, it's maths. Family is the wrong answer. You don't turn your back on family. <laughs> oh my gosh. Shout out Jeremy Lynch official on Instagram, the greatest follow. <laughs> But you know, when we talk about family, we're talking about family of origin, we're talking about significant relationships, we're talking about our natural family, but we're also talking about our spiritual family. And I don't know where you sit and with your own family, but I wanna just encourage you, when we're talking about family, we're looking at all the different relationships that are shaping us, that are, that are, that are holding us together, that are encouraging us, those areas of identity. Because the challenge with any name, the challenge with any label, is that so often we assume upon definitions. We just use the same words. I mean, come on, any married people, you know what I'm talking about. She says that, you said that, and she's like, well, that's not what I said, that's exactly what you said. And it's like, you're using the same words, but you've got completely different definitions of it. It's like, I helped you, you didn't help, that's not helping. It's like, wait, what? You know, same words, same labels, different definitions. Like, I'm married to an Australian. Now, if you go to my Australian wife and you talk about, you know, Christmas and your Christmas memories, you say, oh, the weather last year, it was very Christmassy. I know as a Dane what you're talking about. You're talking about horrible, crappy weather. It's cold, it's wet, it's sloppy snow here in Copenhagen, little gray, it's, but it's, it's nice, it's Euclid. But you talk to an Australian about Christmassy weather, it's about 35 to 40 degrees sunny, it's beach, it's cricket, it's a barbecue, it's 23 degree aircon on inside, that's Christmassy. Same label, different definitions. When we talk about family, I understand that in a crowd of this size, that we all have different definitions based on our experience. We, talk, we use words like God is a good father. That's a label, that's a name. But I understand that you and I, we have different definitions of what a dad is. And I know that some people here, that when we come together in moments like this, where we highlight something as significant as family, for some of you, this is not a positive memory. For some of you, this is someone that didn't do their job the way that they were supposed to. Maybe they were absent. Maybe they, 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 it was misused. Maybe it was just a horrible experience. And you gotta understand that that doesn't take away from the fact that God, He places us in family, that God believes in family. And if your natural family was a place of pain, I believe that God can lead you into a spiritual family that can bring healing, that can bring restoration, because God is still a good and perfect Father. And we do not have to lower the image of God based on the picture that we have and the experience we have of a natural father. We don't have to lower the image of family, the spiritual family called church, based on the brokenness that maybe you and I, we have experienced in the natural. Because God loves healthy families. 
The Bible says in Psalm 68, verse 6, it says, God places the lonely in families. Is that beautiful? God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. Or as Desmond Tutu, who recently just passed away, he once said, you don't choose your family. They are God's gift to you, and you are to them. You don't choose your family. If we have to be honest, though, sometimes when you think about your own family, gift is not the first word that pops in your head. I mean, I guess that's the blessing of families, is they keep it real. They keep you real. Keep you grounded, as they say. You know, just letting you know who you are. But at the same time, family is, is, is supposed to be the place of authenticity. It's supposed to be the place where you can bring your, your gifts and your weaknesses. It's supposed to be the place where you can lower the mask and lower the guards and lower the walls, a greenhouse where you can flourish. But in order for family to be a healthy place, each member of that family, you know, where we can flourish. Sorry, I thought you were about to give me something. I was like, are you handing me a camera? Okay, thank you. Can I have that? Okay, one second. Oh, I clicked on something, sorry. It's a great photo that you had of me, great. You know, in order for a family to be healthy and flourishing, each member of the family has to have that revelation that this is a place where I can treasure. This is a place where I can belong. We say in church, we are who we are. We are corporately who we are as individuals. And so when we're looking at church, we have to be the family we want to see. You want your family to be more encouraging? You be encouraging. You want your family to be a place that is full of joy? You be full of joy. You want your family to be a place where there's great atmosphere, where people are loving and serving one another? You be that person. Be the person that you want to see. That counts for your natural family. That counts for your spiritual family. Be the person that you want to see. I saw Simon Sinek, he posted this picture the other day where he said, do not complain, contribute. Do not complain, contribute. I spoke with someone just a few days ago, struggling in the whole area of, of abuse, and we were telling him about your story, running. And um, <clears throat> he's like, man, I, I need to meet him and, you know, talk. And, and I love that out of his own pain, um, he said, you know what, I want to I wanna be part of, you know, I want to talk to Ronnie and see if we can do something. And find other people that are suffering with addictions and suffering in this area. And I, I want to contribute. I want to see if we can create a place in church where other people can come in and they can find hope and they can find answer just like we have found hope and found answer. See, I love that people like you, people like this person, they don't walk into church and go, I cannot believe we don't have this program. I cannot believe that we don't have this. No, instead it's saying, I wanna be part of creating a space. I wanna be part of contributing in order to help others. Or like the other week, I had dinner with someone in our church who was just a young family guy. And he's like, can we do more for young families? I'm like, yeah, what do you suggest? And he just said, my hand is up. My wife and I, our hands are up. We wanna be part of the answer. That is family. See, guests, they complain. Family, they contribute. Guests, they walk away from a dinner party going, that was a bit sloppy, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, guests, they walk away from a dinner party going, did you like that food? I don't know if I like that food. But families, they contribute. Families, they, they take ownership. Family, they see what they can do to help set the table. But the honesty of family is also what can be annoying about families, hey? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, you know, it doesn't matter how much success you have, you will still be the snotty little younger brother, younger sister <laughs> when you get home to your family. I don't care how tall I have grown, I am the tallest in my family, but I'm still the youngest of six, and I am told every time I'm with my family. My sister, who is 50 plus years old, hope you're not watching because I cannot remember your age, we, you know, we were together a few weeks ago. We still wrestle, and she still thinks she can take me, you know, because I'm the youngest. My brother-in-law still reminds me of the 12-year-old kid I was wearing a denim shirt with casa hair at their wedding. You know, just to remind, why? Because that's what family does. But there's something reassuring about that as well, because you're reminded you belong here. You're reminded this is your identity. This is where... 
you came for. And identity and reality, I believe these days, is so much under attack. I mean, the last few years, I mean, people, they've had so much taken away from them in this season. So much that they've used to put identity in. So much that they used to put in for their purpose. And it's been taken away, for better and for worse. It's been taken away. And now left wondering what their purpose actually is. I remember once I was flying, and um, I don't remember flying anymore, but uh, my habit when we used to fly was that I used to download whatever, epi- you know, whatever series I was binge watching at the time, I used to download that on the iPad and then just binge it on a flight. I mean, that it just, it was, that was my little you know, getaway. And I remember this one time I was flying to America and I was binge watching Designated Survivor. Now, if you don't know Designated Survivor, this is, um, this is no spoiler alert because it's in the trailer, but, but really, if you haven't watched it by now, you know, shame on you. But <laughs> Designated Survivor, Capitol Hill gets blown up. All the senators are dead, or are they? And, and there is a Designated Survivor who has to, you know, assume the presidency. But I was, I was binge watching this for like six, seven hours straight. So much that when I landed in America, like, I actually thought that it was real. Like, I'm landing, I'm like, why are they not saying anything in the news about this? My reality had been so skewed that it took me a few hours to realize that everything is, you know, relatively okay in America. Sorry. You see, isolation distorts reality. Just like distance distorts reality. When you're isolated from something, when you are distant from something, it distorts reality. You start seeing it different. Think about when there is distance in your relationship. Reality gets messed up. Hey, suddenly you see things that are not there. Suddenly you're making up things and it's like, what's going on? And you're reading into, you're reading between the lines and you're reading books between the lines because distance distorts reality. When there is distance between you and God, it distorts who he is. Oh, he, he's, he's angry at me. He's mean. It's like, no, 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 no. You're just, you have, you've got distance. Isolation distorts reality. Distance distorts reality. And this is why we need family. Because we can be so preoccupied with our own little world. Be so preoccupied with what happens in my, within my four walls, for better and for worse, that it's distorting my reality. That I'm forgetting who I am start acting in weird ways. And, 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 you know, we're talking about these corona decisions and corona choices people are making. Just, you know, and, and then the question is afterwards, I didn't, I didn't know I was capable of this because there was isolation. There was no one there to remind you of your true identity. One of my favorite quotes is by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote from a Nazi prison in Second World War that the Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain, his brother's sure. Basically what he's saying is that Jesus in my brother is stronger than Jesus in me because my faith can be distorted by what is going on around me. You know, when you're sick, when you're really sick, I'm not just talking about man flu, when you're like really sick, man, you start thinking, oh man, I, I, I don't know if God can heal. I, I remember in, in Sydney, I was so sick one time. I think I had the pig flu or something, swine flu. I think that's what it was. And um, I was so sick that I got up in the middle of the night. I was sweating. It's like 2 or 3 a.m. I got up in the middle of the night. I went out in the living room, sat in front of the air conditioning, and I started Googling life insurances. I go, this is it. I'm dying tonight. And I'm like, can you, can you get a life insurance without a doctor's report? And I'm like Googling, Googling this. I'm like, I'm just going to sign up. I mean, I don't want my wife to be left with no money. You know, I'm like, anyone with me? Come on. You lie. You lie. Three of you, whatever. You know, your pinky hurts and you're Googling it. Now it's like, oh, you know, that's, you know, that's the side effect of Chernobyl in 1986. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> Google, man, it's like a dangerous, dark, deep hole. But it's so true that your immediate circumstances can distort your faith. And so we need a brother, we need a sister, we need family to remind us of the truth. I wonder who you call. Who are you gonna call? I wonder who you call. I wonder who you call when things are bad. 
I wonder who you call and just say, hey, can you remind me of the calling on my life? Hey, can you remind me why this marriage is worth fighting for? Hey, can you remind me why I should be reading my Bible? Hey, can you remind me why this matters? Hey, I know for me, if you know, honestly, I'm uh, all that, you know, I, I have had times during Corona where I've called friends like Phil Dooley and others in my life going, can you remind me why we do this again? Just can you just give me a reminder? Why do we do this? I love you. I'm saying that to all you guys. I love you guys. But I've had moments where people, I've had to call the people in my world and say, tell me again why people matter. <laughs> Am I the only one? Yeah, okay, cool. I feel bad. Everyone's like, who are you? <laughs> Why are we here? <laughs> but we need people in our world, brothers and sisters that can remind us of the truth. Remind us, tell me, is my thinking right in this? How's my attitude? What are you seeing? Talk to me about my gift. The challenge is though, that often we don't realize the amazing people that we have in our world. We take them for granted. Oh, first time we meet them, it's like, whoa. <laughs> Second time it's like, whoa. Third time, it's like, ugh. <laughs> we take them for granted. We take the opportunity for granted. Maybe we've gotten used to them. See, in order to give our family our best, we must not let us being familiar become familiarity. In order to give our family the best, we must not let us being familiar with one another turn into familiarity. Familiarity is when you start taking people for granted, taking your natural family for granted, taking your kids for granted, taking your wife for granted, your husband for granted, your parents for granted, taking your friends for granted, taking your church for granted. In Mark chapter six, verse one, it says that Jesus left that part of the country. He returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Oh my goodness, they asked. Where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? That's where they started. Now listen, to the, listen look at the escalator, they're gone. Then they scoffed. So they went like, O-M-G. Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. His sisters, they live right here among us. They were deeply offended. <laughs> I mean, they've gone from like, oh my gosh, I will follow him for the rest of my life to now being offended by him. And they refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed. Now he's amazed. He was amazed at their unbelief. Look at the train of thought. It started with, oh my gosh, look at what Jesus is saying. Look at what he's doing. And there's like, yeah, but wait, 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 wait. He's always here. He grew up here. Hey, I used to know him when he was 12, and you know, he's, he's not that special. <laughs> you know, everyone can do that in Nazareth. You know, like suddenly we start talking him down. We start, you know, start using logic and start going, yeah, I don't know. And, and isn't he always here? And, you know, I met his brother. That's not my, his brother says he's not that awesome. And, and you know, his sisters, you know, you don't want to talk to his sisters. And, you know, I don't even know if his dad is his real dad. I've heard rumors, you know. You know, people start talking about Jesus and talking him down to the point of just being offended. I wonder what our response is to the people that matter the most. You remember when you fell in love? Oh my gosh, look at her. Oh my gosh. Oh, he's so cute. 10 years into marriage. Oh my gosh. Ooh, it's awake. What happened? Oh my gosh, can you believe this church? It's amazing, it's amazing. Oh man, this church is always around, it's still here. <laughs> what happened? Familiarity, familiarity. Those friends, those people in your world, 
that have so much wisdom, so much to offer. Those people that, want, that, that love you, but familiarity breeds content. Let's not become familiar with our spouse. Let's not become familiar with our kids. Let's not become familiar with our friends. Let's not become familiar with our colleagues. Let's not become familiar with our church family. Let's not become familiar with our pastors and our team. Let's not become familiar with our church family around us. Let us not become familiar. How do I not become familiar? How do I give them the best? How do I think about them first? Just seven quick things. They are quick, but there is seven. How do I not become familiar with the people that matter the most? Number one, be present. Be present. Meaning, if you're with someone, be with them. Don't be with someone on social media. You know, there is not, you know when you go into a restaurant or you go to a, a, a business or something and you're talking to someone like in front of you and then the phone rings. You're talking and then the phone rings. And then they go, that. Man, I want to snap that finger off. They do like that. And then they, take up, they pick up the phone. That is as rude as if a person had walked into the room and just gone, <laughs> and start talking. You would never allow that. Yet because it's an electronic thing in front of them, apparently that is okay. Be present. Meaning, if you said yes to meeting up with someone, then meet up with them. That means your phone, if you can't turn it off, face down. Just be present. Be, or don't, don't be present. Just don't say yes to the appointment. But don't say yes to the appointment and then not be there. Is, is that okay? Be present. With kids, I know for us, this, this or for me, I'm saying us, to soften the blow on myself, but... For me, you know, month of January, and I'll continue this year, we just said no social media in the morning. Just be present. You know, you've, you've got an hour, you've got an hour and a half before the kids end school. Just be present. Don't be on your, you put your phone away. Just be present. Number two, be thankful. You want, you want to battle familiarity? Be thankful. And can I say a little key to gratitude? The more specific it is, the more impacting it is. If you say to someone, oh, you're great, thanks, thanks, that's, yeah, you know, you're catching a little bit of a good vibe, but that's it. But you say to someone, hey, you know when you said that the other day, that really blessed me, thank you. You know when you, I noticed that you did this, you, you, thank you. Just be specific, the more specific, the more Impacting, and, and sometimes, you know, if you can't find anything, you've got to be creative <laughs> slash prophetic. <laughs> just, just thank them in advance for something. Hey, thanks for, you know, being awesome, you know, even though they're not awesome. Just be prophetic. Speak it into being. The problem is that some of us, we, we, we talk to us, to family, we talk to friends, and we're talking down about them. You no good sitting on the couch. Why don't you go in there? Come on, wives, you go in there. You look at your husband, you go, you sexy son of a gun. <laughs> look at you. My goodness, what a hunk of a man. Thank you for taking care of yourself so well. Thank you for eating right and having such an amazing sculpted body. You watch that guy, you know, slither his way out of the couch. <gasps> you know, get out in front of the mirror. It's like, yeah, that's right. You see him walk out there and find those old running shoes he hasn't put on for 20 years. That is right, I am sculpting this body. This is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Be thankful. Number three, be honoring. Be honoring. The question is, how do you talk about people to others? That will show you honor. How do you talk about your wife? How do you talk about your husband? How do you talk about your kids? How do you talk about your friends? How do you talk about your pastor? How do you talk about church? Not to them. To others. When they're not around, that shows the level of honor. Number four, be generous. Generosity kills familiarity. Be generous. Be generous. With, serve. Serve with your time. Serve with your energy. Serve with your words. Serve with finances. Serve with opportunities. Open doors. I love opening doors for people. Not just physical doors, but I love. If someone says to me, I need a job, or I need this, or I need a place, and I know about someone that has that, 
I'm like, oh, I know someone, I know someone. I love it, I love connecting people. To serve people, serve with opportunities, open doors, connect people, serve with your gifts, serve with service, acts of kindness. And the question is not what matters to you, the question is what matters to them. Speak their love language, yeah? Like it might have meant a lot to you, but does it mean anything to them? So speak that, serve, be generous. Paul says that, you know, the, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he talks about these people who became idle, just with too much time on their hand. And then they became busybodies, just going from house to house, talking about things they should not talk about. Let's not become those Christians. If you, if you find yourself becoming familiar with church, can I challenge you? Start serving. Start serving and you watch something start stirring up again of gratitude and love for the house. Number five, be covering. Be covering, which means protect their reputation. Protect your family's reputation. Protect your family's reputation. Protect your friends. Pray for them. Pray for them. Whenever I have an issue with a person, I start blessing them. It's amazing how it changes your heart. I remember I had this one guy I was so annoyed with and I put his picture up on my, on my wall. And I, in, the, in the beginning, I just wanted to throw dot, you know, arrows at him. But instead, I said, Lord, I pray you, you know, bless him with thunder. You know, no. I pray you bless him. Be with him. And it's amazing how your heart changes. Number six, be interested. Be interested. Relationships cannot be a one-way street. You've got to pursue them. If you're finding yourself, you're always the one being pursued, I wonder if you've grown familiar, if you're just taking people for granted. Pursue them, be interested. And lastly, number seven, be gracious. Be gracious, show grace. And this is my question. What will you do the day they offend you? I often ask that to people to, to join our church. They come up to me and they go, oh, I love church. I love your preaching. This is awesome. And I'm like, thanks. What are you gonna do the day I offend you? I will offend you. Our church will offend you. If, if, if church never offends you, we're not preaching the gospel because the gospel will offend you. That's why Jesus said, you know, when he spoke and he preached, people were like, e, this is harsh, I'm leaving. And Jesus turns to his disciples like, are you gonna leave me too? And Peter says, where can we go? This is, you're the only one that holds the words of eternal life. I'm not saying we're gonna offend for the sake of offending, but my question to you, what would you do the day I offend you, the preaching offends you? What would you do in your relationships when they offend you, when they tell you the truth, for example? What would you do? Choose when you're strong who you're gonna be when you're offended so that you can remind each other. I, I, I spoke to one of my friends um, when he first became a Christian, and I said to him, hey bro, what are you gonna do the day I offend you? And he looked at me and he's like, that question assumes that you haven't already offended me. <laughs> and he said, Thomas, your mere presence offends me. <laughs> I'm like, great, it's good to know. <laughs> Some of you will know who that is, but what would you do the day they offend you. Let me finish with this. Ephesians 2.19, that's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country, your family. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, you belong here? Oh, come on, you can say that with a bit more conviction. Just say, you belong here. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. He's using us all, irrespective of how we got here in what He is building. He used the apostles, the prophets for the foundation. Now He's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God. All of us built into it, a temple in which God is quiet at home. One of the questions I've been asked over this corona season is um, sometimes a question, sometimes just a statement. It's like, we've lowered the bar a bit, hey, as a church. We've lowered the bar, what it means to be Hillsong. And what they mean, and the question when I, when I dig deeper is, you know, 
It seems like we've lowered the bar in terms of volunteers on platform, lowered the bars how many volunteers are involved, lowered the bars in maybe standard of execution or whatever. And I'm like, well, first of all, it's been challenging. Yes, we've gone through some challenging days. That it, there's no lie there. I mean, it's been challenging the last two years. But have we lowered the bar? Absolutely not. The challenge is that some people think the product of church is the performance that happens up here. This is not the product. The product of a local church is the family, it's the community, it's the interactions, it's the relationships that takes place at church on a Sunday, at church in a home group, in a connect group, what happens out there on the streets, that is where church happens. Yes, there is part of our church where this is an expression of who we are, but the very end product of who we are as a local church is that we are a community of God gathered under the name of Jesus around the common cause of building the kingdom of God and believing the kingdom of heaven will invade this thing called earth. That is who we are. So absolutely not. We have always been about family and we will always be about family. And you belong here. And I want to just take a moment now before we finish. And I want to pray for anyone here that maybe, whether this is your first Sunday or you've been here many Sundays, I don't know. But maybe you've had this sense of you're on the outside looking in. You're on the outside looking in. We've often had this way of explaining church of saying, you know, belong, believe, behave meaning anyone can belong. And over time, you will start to believe. And over time, it will start to result in behavior and change in your life and change in the way that you think and all the rest of it. But it's actually belong, believe, belong. Because while anyone is welcome here, there is a community of faith in this room as well. And the only way to really be part of that community is to say yes to Jesus. We're not just here because we happen to go to Hillsong. We're not just ha here just because we happen to gather at Falconer on a Sunday or wherever we're gathering online right now. No, we belong to each other because what unites us is not the name of a church. What unites us is the name of our Savior, Jesus. And I'd love to pray for anyone here today that you've never said yes to Jesus or maybe you once did but you found yourself just walking away and now you feel a little bit like you're on the outside looking in. No shame. No shame. Today is your day of not being on the outside looking in. But can we open the doors for you? We'd love to open the doors and welcome you home and include you in the family. So can we just get everyone to close your eyes just to give everyone a moment of privacy? And I'd love to pray for you, whether it's your first time to say yes to Jesus, or whether today you're coming back to Him. I'm gonna to count to three. And when I get to three, I want every person who wants to say yes for the first time. Or today you're coming back. When I say three, just to lift your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. Even if you're online, this is your moment. At the end of the day, this is not about me. This is about you and it's about Jesus. So I'm gonna to count to three. And when I get to three, just lift your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. And then I'm gonna pray. You ready? One. Do not let this moment slip by. Do not put it off to a moment you're not guaranteed you have. We have right here and right now. Two, I'm not talking to the person next to you. I'm talking to you. Do you know Jesus? I'm not saying go out, become perfect, come in, and then He will love you. He already loves you. All that's left for you to do is to say yes. So when I say three, just lift your hand. You ready? On three, three. Just lift your hands all over this place. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see your hand over there, thank you. Online, you lift your hand. Malna, you lift your hand. Olba, Aarhus. This is your moment. Anyone else here today? Beautiful, beautiful, that's amazing. Okay, you can put your hands down. We're gonna say a prayer and I wanna ask everyone to say this prayer together. Come on, whether it's you lifted your hand or you didn't, just say this prayer after me. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I'm sorry. For my, for my mistakes and my sin. And my sin. But, today, but today, I choose you. I, choose you. I, make you my Lord and I make you my Lord and Savior. And from today, and from today I, am forgiven. I am forgiven. 
I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. And I am free. And I am free. In the, In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Come on, can we congratulate? So good. So good, man, a massive congratulations if you lifted your hand and more importantly, you prayed that prayer. We are so excited for you. We, we, get, we get excited because we know what it meant for us and we know what it can mean for you. But at the end of the day, you've made a decision. Now you've got to walk it out. We'd love to help you in that walk. So on the way out, we've got some of our amazing volunteers just staying with Bible pickup signs here in the parents' lounge with the VIPs in the other locations. And um, we just want to give you, and if you're online, then just contact us um, and at next at hillsong.dk. And we'd love to send you a Bible. And it's a New Testament Bible. This one is like a magazine format. We have an English, Danish, Swedish versions. And I want to encourage you, just like you eat every day, drink every day, breathe every day. Can I encourage you? Make this part of your daily bread. Just get a bit of word into you and you watch that as you're reading the Bible over time, it's not you reading the Bible, it's the Bible reading you. It starts to change you from the inside out. And just like the algorithms understand exactly what is going on in your life, so the Bible, it kind of just gets you. Just like Ronnie said in the, in the video, it's like every time I read the Bible, it just happens to speak about what is going on in my life right now. That is what the Word of God can do. So can I encourage you, grab one of the, the Bibles on the way out. And then secondly, just keep coming back. Find yourself in a family that will encourage you and remind you of your identity and your purpose. Amen? Amen. Come on, can we give all those people one more hand? So good. All right, let's stand to our feet. In a moment, we're going to have a song of something, a song of praise. Not a song of praise, a song, yes? What do you think? It's about celebration. Okay, a song of celebration. It's great. I thought you had a little shot glass here, but it's, you know, a slider. I was like, geez, you're parting up up here. And then in half an hour-ish, we have got Sonny Kagara, the finalist. Denmark has got talent which he was cheated off, by the way. You should have won, and you know that. We all know that. Uh, but the show is going to be in here. This guy, um, he's a, well, he's not a magician because we don't believe in magic, um, but we, uh, he is incredible. You are going to love this. Uh, and it's not, trust me, this is not just for the kids. This is for the whole family. I was telling the story last week that, because one of the things that Sonny does, he, he teaches in like Trektoring, so like he teaches police and like different things and whatever. And we were sitting, our kids go to the same school and we we're sitting one day and we we're talking to them like, how do people get their watch stolen? And he's like, oh, and he's explaining how it works. And I'm like, and then I'm like, oh, you gotta be an idiot to have your watch stolen. At that point, he hands me my watch back to me. This guy's awesome, you're gonna love him. So afterwards, go out, grab a coffee, come back in at 12.30. The kids are gonna come in, it's going to be, you need to go and get them, and it's going to be amazing. And then tonight, we've got a pre-show starting at 5.30. But can I pray for you? Yeah. And I wanna encourage you, if you find yourself with church, that you're like, man, I just wanna be more part of the family. I wanna get more involved. I wanna serve, I wanna belong, I wanna, whatever it is. We got our next lounge right outside. Just go out in all the locations as well. Go out to the next lounge, speak to the team there and say, how can I get involved? How can I serve? How can I give? How can I contribute? How can I be part of this? And let's believe our ninth year will be our best year. Come hell or high water, come Corona, come the rest of it. Let's believe that the best is yet to come. So Jesus, we thank You so much for who You are. We thank You that You place the lonely in families, Lord God. I thank You there is not one person here that has to feel like they're on the outside looking in, Lord God, but they belong here, Lord Jesus. And where there is hurt and pain from their natural family, I thank You for Your healing in people's lives, Lord God. Lord, we just commit this year to You. We thank You for the previous nine years. We thank You for what You have done, Lord God. But Lord, we wanna say in advance, thank You for what is about to happen, Lord God. We just give You all the glory and all the praise. And we thank You for our family members, our, the people in our world who still don't know You. Our I pray this ninth year will be the year where they experience your power and your love and your forgiveness. We give you all the glory and all the praise in the name of Jesus we pray. And church, if you believe it, can you shout amen? 
Amen. We love you, church.